Just before we start the show, I want to take an opportunity to invite you to join me for the Podfluence Weekly Newsletter, which is available both on LinkedIn and through the official newsletter channel. Now, if you are on LinkedIn and it's easier for you to follow there, then please just click on the link in the show notes, which will take you straight to Podfluence on LinkedIn, where you can subscribe for free and get weekly updates on Podfluence articles as well as episodes. If you would like to subscribe to the full newsletter where you'll get additional materials and, as my little incentive to you, my pre-podcast guest checklist for you to use when you're appearing on podcast shows so that you can be fully prepared every single time, then please click the link to the official newsletter in the show notes. Hope to see you there. Let's get on with the show. Welcome to the show. My name is Johnny Ball. This is Speaking Influence, the show where we delve into the knowledge, skills, experience and stories and secrets of some of the world's best influence and persuasion experts. We have in-depth conversations with people who are out in the world applying and often teaching tools of ethical influence and persuasion. And sometimes we stop and take a look at the not so ethical side of things too. Guests range from successful authors and entrepreneurs, secret service members and psychologists, marketing and branding experts, even the occasional professional comedian or world champion in public speaking or storytelling. We've had former cult members, neuroscientists, voice coaches, professional stylists, political speech writers and public speaking experts. Every episode takes our guests' knowledge and experience and turns it into actionable information that you can use to build a deeper understanding of how the world of influence and persuasion works, becoming more charismatic and becoming a better wielder of the weapons of ethical influence and persuasion in life and business, leaving each of us a little smarter than before and also hopefully protecting us from the unethical uses of influence and persuasion. Now, for a show that's coming up to its second birthday, it may be surprising to some of you that we haven't yet covered today's topic, which is influencer marketing. And that certainly hasn't been because I haven't wanted to. It really has been about finding the right person to have that discussion with. And my guest today, I think, is absolutely the right person to have that discussion with. In fact, as I re-listened to the recording recently, I realized she was the perfect person to have this conversation with. And this has been one of my favorite conversations in the show. My guest is Whitney Lauritsen, and I do make a bit of a faux pas, perhaps at the start of the show, for introducing Whitney as an influencer, or at least as someone who could be described as an influencer. There are so many negative associations with that term that I can understand why she perhaps didn't appreciate that at the start. We got past it very quickly, and we had a really fun and in-depth conversation about the power of influencer marketing, how so many people are missing a trick in influencer marketing these days, what it really could be, where the real power is, and that it's not in the vanity metrics as so many people tend to mistake it as being, but in the connection that people have with their audience. You're going to get gems like this and much more from the conversation that we have. So I will leave it to you to enjoy the show. Welcome to Speaking Influence, the show that explores the psychology and application of ethical influence and persuasion in life and business with persuasive presentations and podcasting coach, Johnny Ball. If you have an online business, you need to work on list building. The easiest way to get started for free is ConvertKit. It's recommended by industry pros like Pat Flynn, Chris Ducker, and our very own Johnny Ball. Click the link in the show notes and start building your list today. Welcome to the show, Whitney Larson. I'm very happy to be speaking to you today. Likewise, I'm excited to see what we're going to explore today. It's going to be fun. And... uh, One thing I want to ask you before we get into exactly what we're going to talk about and even why is if there was one invention that didn't exist that you would have to invent if it wasn't there, what would it be? Wow, that's a big question. Well, it's interesting because right now I feel very passionate about live video. So I suppose if I could invent live video streaming, I would be very interested in that. I'm really into technology and developing tools, and uh, I get really excited about anything that's that's new. So right now, I'm exploring cryptocurrency, which isn't really new, but I feel like it's it's a concept that so many people are trying to better understand. And 
Live video, I feel, is somewhat similar because it's been around. It's been pretty popular for, you know, at least five or six years, but we're still really finding our footing with it. And I think the past year and a half from 2020 to 2021 has given people a lot of opportunity to experience live video, similar to what we're doing here today. Yeah, I, I can agree with you on that one. I think if there is one thing for me that didn't exist that I would hope I could invent because I just need it in my life so much, it would be my Android device. Because <laughs> I, yeah. I rely far too heavily on it, like probably like most people. <laughs> It's, it's become yep. like an extension of us. It's, we're, we're almost cyborgs with these things now. Absolutely. So that's not what we're here to talk about today, though. It's just a bit <laughs> of fun to get us started. One of the reasons why I've been so keen to speak with you, particularly Whitney, is because I've never officially had somebody who I could describe or define as an influencer on the show before. And for a show that's called Speaking Influence, you think... How, how has it taken so long? And, and yet you are someone who we could describe as an influencer. Would, would you describe yourself as an influencer? No. In fact, if I had thought about it, I would have taken out the hat that I often wear, which says not an influencer on the brim of it, because <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of that term. But I, I work in influencer marketing on a number of sides of it. So yes, I've been a, a content creator, which is a term I, I more prefer technically since 2008. But when the term started to develop back in 2015-ish, I would estimate, certainly I wanted to carry that title because it was a quick way to describe who I am and what I did. But in the last few years, I felt less and less interested of, about using that term because I think it gets associated with people that do things differently than me, which I suppose we can get in, into <laughs> throughout the episode. Yeah. And that's definitely something that I want to, that there's been a lot of negative things attached to the term influencer now. And a lot of people who are, I guess it's kind of mostly attached to people who are famous for being famous. They're famous for doing nothing or for doing dumb stuff <laughs> not really famous for for particularly good reasons not really influential for good reasons and and a lot of people have really abused the position of trust that perhaps has been given to people who might have been more influential at the time but what would be the good definition for you and what do you think is the not so well i think being able to influence people for good is a great thing of course and a lot of us as human beings, look to other people to help us make decisions. And so for me, a, a huge part of my work over the years has been about product and service recommendations, which I still do to this day. I do that on my podcast. I have I started a second podcast in the past few months, actually exclusively about products and service recommendations, because my main podcast, that my co-host and I would weave that into it. But the two of us met through our work at, in this influencer marketing content creation sphere. And it's been an exciting place because so many people will come to me anyways, and they still do offline to ask me, what do I think of something? What do I recommend? How can I help somebody make a decision? And I've noticed that my brain works in a way in which I can, I can like, scan something and get a gut feeling about it. And then I can collect the information and decide which I'm going to choose from, right? And I, many of us do this on platforms like Amazon. But many of us have, have also been in that position of feeling like so overwhelmed and frustrated and not trusting what a brand is saying about what they're putting out. So I think influencers have a really great opportunity to help us make decisions and excite us the downside, I suppose, is that, as you said, it can be used just to build up the ego, just to make money. It can use, be used for a lot of like external validation, external measurements of success. And I'm not a big fan of that. In fact, earlier today on Twitter, uh, I saw somebody, I don't know if I was following him or somehow it was just in my feed, an older man, older than me, I should say, posted a like a collage of influencer images and said, looking at this, I see 
marketing from the 1950s as true artwork. And his point was that the marketing that we're doing now in 2021 tends to be has this feeling of, of maybe not a lot of depth, right? It's, it feels more superficial. It feels more fake. And I think yeah. that's a bigger issue that I feel. There's a great documentary on HBO called Fake Famous, and it's exposing and highlighting the sides of this industry in which people are building so much of their work on uh, a lack of authenticity, and I, I'm not a fan of that. And that's actually yeah. made my work more challenging for me. I have trouble posting online if I don't feel deeply connected to it. So that's that's kind of like given me a lot of pause. So you end up with this situation where you are limiting yourself with some of the things that you might have otherwise posted because you don't want to be associated or put into a particular camp of content creator or online personality. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, I would say so. I also feel like it's harder now because every day, multiple times a day usually, I have brands reaching out to me. And what shifted is that they assume that I'm going to do things a certain way. And I don't feel like they fully know who I am or value it. They will either take a quick glance and really just focus on my numbers, my my vanity metrics, if you want to call them that, my following, whatever. Or they'll see the keywords that I've used to describe myself, or they'll find me in some database. And they'll reach out with these generic messages that I feel like position their communication as if I'm just a person in this sea of influencers, right? That's such an awful feeling to me because I thrive on human mm. connection. I thrive in depth. And that's an example of yeah. what's changed over time versus it was quite different when I first started. I remember vividly when I started reaching out to brands back in probably 2009 or 2010, having built up my work with my blog mainly before social media grew, I started reaching out to brands and saying, hey, I would love to try your product. I would love to share it on my website. And back then the brands were confused as to why I was asking and they were unsure. And there was this hesitancy in the communication. And I've noticed the industry evolve over time from a lot of hesitancy and just kind of thinking what I was doing was a bit bizarre to now it's it's like the op swung, swung in the opposite direction where now it's not bizarre and now I'm no longer unique in that sense. I'm I'm like in this group of so many people and then thus I don't always feel like I matter as much and I feel like that can really do a damper on your, your self-esteem, but also like <laughs> it takes out the humanity of it. I think that's probably my biggest yeah. – challenge is that I, I want to feel human connection and I want to feel like I matter and the work I'm doing matter. I don't want to feel like, you know, a little fish in a big pond, I suppose, <laughs> or a big sea. What is the <laughs> term? Really, I, <laughs> I, I guess I can kind of relate to it in, in a different, in a different sense that I've sometimes wished I could be like one of the, one of those hot guys with a six pack who could post a first trap on Twitter and get a huge following from it. But then I thought, yeah, but that's your following then. They're following you because you're hot, not following you because you're saying anything valuable or interesting. You might, but they're also thinking, well, they're only following you because they want to see more pictures like that. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, like that, that's the that's the thing is like it'll get you a following but it might not get you the right following and uh, so, so I, I mean I, I get the dilemma but I'm certainly not quite from the level that, you, that perhaps you experience it yeah, but, uh, but I think I can understand it at least and I think it's actually doing some damage to marketing as a whole because I also advise a number of companies and small business owners and it's such a frustrating challenge these days because a lot of people are focused on the metrics. Not only do they want to grow their following, but they want to collaborate with other people's simply because of their numbers. And again, with someone like me being very interested in, in the human connection element and the purpose of it and the long-term benefits of it, 
I think it's very short-sighted because it, it, it takes away from the true reason that many of us started in the first place. And to your point, especially when I work with businesses that have a product or a service that they're marketing, there's not a huge benefit in just growing your audience unless it's the right audience. And there's not a big benefit to partnering mm-hmm. with somebody, collaborating or you know, getting them involved with your company because their audience is not going to care about what you're doing and not going to buy your products or services if they're not the right fit. And I think a lot of people are, are spending a lot of money simply to get the vanity metrics, but that doesn't give you a true return on investment yeah. on a number of levels. And that's very frustrating to watch. Yeah. yeah, you might be able to leverage it somewhat, but it's a whole bunch of bought following is not going to be nearly as valuable to you in the long run as an actual targeted uh, reach out to people who are initially interested in what you're actually talking about and what you're there for. Uh, so, yeah, I, I get exactly what you're saying. And I, I see that everywhere. And I'm sure anyone who's doing online business and content creation in these senses has at least an idea about that, even if they're not directly experiencing uh, the, those issues themselves. They're probably aware of it, if, if nothing else. Certainly from from my connection with you, like when we chatted a while back, one of the things that I remembered very vividly from that conversation was that you were all about connection and there was nothing superficial about, you know, I, I know you, you sort of winced when I, when I mentioned the word influencer and, and it's like that I know that there's all that negative stuff attached to it, but there's also, there is also a, like a positive side to it. And we talked a little bit about influencer marketing, which I do want to really come on to because I think it's, uh, it's somewhere where people are missing a trick right now, but it's a, uh, it's a real deep sense of, I, I feel it's very important to have that relationship marketing stuff. And I've had a lot of people on who've been talking about relationship marketing. And I get a very strong sense from you that's really important for you. And I hope and I think it's the way that things are going. I think it's the way of the future. Do you think that it is moving very much in that way? Do you see some signs of hope there? Or do you think there's still a long way to go? I do see signs of hope. I do. I also think that we have a long way to go. Because right now, influencer marketing is just growing exponentially. I'm so involved in it with it on both sides. Having been a creator, I'm on so many newsletter lists and I'm, I'm in influencer marketing marketplaces and um, just I'm connected to so many people that work as influencers and seeing where there's no signs of slowing down on that side. And then again, on the advising side, I I see just like there's still that older mentality. And I think this is true with most things is it takes a while for people to shift. So again, when I started my work over 10 years ago, it took a good five to six years for people to take my work seriously and to understand what it is that I did. For many years, people just incredibly confused. The only term that they could understand was blogger. And it was like, oh, you're a blogger. And I'm like, no, I, I blog sometimes, but I'm also doing social media and I'm doing video content. And it just was strange. And so seeing as it took five or six years for that shift to happen and seeing as it took another five or six years since 2015 for influencer marketing to really be commonplace, maybe we have another five or six years to go until there's a huge shift. And I, I imagine what's going to happen is that a lot of people are going to end up feeling like I do. And I, I already see this a bit starting, especially in some of the younger content creators out there, like Gen Z right now, I feel like is doing a little bit more questioning. Myself as a millennial, uh, the millennials were kind of moving this influencer world forward for a long time and dominating it. Now Gen Z is is catching up and it's a huge part of their generation. It's very common for them to be content creators in one sense or another. I see a lot of people striving to be influencers full time and feeling like their parents finally understand it, you know. But I also see them addressing the frustrations, addressing burnout. I feel I see them standing up for themselves in new ways and having deeper discussions about this. 
So I imagine that as the industry evolves, it'll be taken more seriously, but people may start to set more boundaries and feel more confident owning who they are beyond the metrics. And that's something that I've been working on for the past year or so. I started a a little project called Beyond Measure. And it was inspired by a lot of these experiences that I had where I felt like people constantly wanted to measure me. I mean, even, even your comment about the body size, that's a huge part of my background was working through body image and disordered eating and, um, just feeling like so much of my life was based on what my body size was. And still to this day, it's a struggle, right? We, we focus a lot on age. We focus on how many followers or friends or how much money somebody is making all of these metrics that don't really make us feel good, but yet we're still in this place where it's like a knee jerk reaction almost to ask somebody like, what they do and and look them up on Instagram and then see how many followers they have and get excited if they have a certain amount or like, you know, recently, yesterday, actually, I was feeling a little like sad (laughs) because some friends of mine who have a lot of followers started this group and it was exclusively for people that either have a lot of followers or make a lot of money. And I didn't meet the threshold in which they, uh, were kind of like the bare minimums, right? And I I felt like so left out because I know deep down that my value has has not that much to do with my follower count. But because others look at those numbers so much, even my friends, I will sometimes get left out or overlooked. And I also see companies doing this a lot when they're choosing influencers to work with. They will start by looking at the numbers. They don't look at the person. Mm. Maybe they look at the the photos they take, but but then they'll click and look at the engagement and the, you know all of those things. Or maybe they'll just look at the pictures and think that it was really easy for this creator to do. But because we don't have a way to scale and quickly measure other elements, the deeper side of things, the humanity starts to get really stripped out. And I don't think that that's a sustainable marketing plan. I think we're going to have to pivot because either brands are going to realize that it's it's not going to work for the long haul. So they're spending a lot of money on very short-term solutions. But influencers and content creators are going to burn out because that's already happening. But this like constant trying to present yourself as a certain way that you may you can't really sustain is not sustainable right like you there's only so many yeah. followers yeah. so so high that your follower account can get and it's never going to feel enough i mean you probably remember back in the day when getting like a few thousand people to watch a video felt like such a big accomplishment. And then it was like, Oh, getting a million people to watch a video (laughs) or a million followers felt like such a big deal. But now the big influencers are getting millions of views on their videos, millions of followers. And now it's like the, the hunt for a billion, you know, it's like, when do we feel like this is enough? And that to me is just yeah. not sustainable if you're always stretching yourself more and more and more beyond who you really are and what really matters at the core of your work. And maybe have some uh, more sense of this in the podcasting world than, than perhaps anywhere else, because I probably, although I have YouTube presence and other social media feeds, I don't actively work that much to grow them, whereas the podcasting I do, but perhaps work a bit more actively now with certain social media feeds because of the podcasting. But then you see very much in the world of podcasting, I, I was getting these statistics from, I think from Semrush and I heard Pat Flynn talking about them as well. Like the average podcast for all the ones that are out there gets about 26 downloads per episode, the average podcast. And we know that there are also podcasts out there that are getting tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of downloads as well so and and there's all sorts of people who are somewhere in between that and and i think ultimately as a podcast you know if it was just the metrics that i ruled everything by that i probably would have stopped podcasting a long time ago 
Yes. And I, so I have to remind myself, I do this because I love it. I do this because I have something to say. I do it because, yes, I want people to find the show and hopefully find it useful and interesting. But if I run it just on, on metrics, I might feel good about that. I, feel, I certainly feel good when the numbers are going up. But if I compare myself to much more successful shows... I might get very upset. <laughs> Comparison being the thief of joy and all that, it's, uh, it, you know, the potential is there. And I think that happens with a lot of podcasters as well because it, it's not always easy to grow a show, especially if you don't know how to do it and what you're doing. But you do know quite a bit about generating, uh, building up a following and creating content and things like that. You know, regardless of that, I know we're sort of saying that the metrics aren't the be-all and end-all, but you have an enviable for most people, what is an enviable following uh, that you have built up and, and earned for yourself. What for you has been key in getting to where in getting to where you are with that following? Well, the truth is that the way I built it up years ago is not true for today in 2021. Because I started focusing on Facebook and Twitter back around 2009-2010, they were relatively new in on um, the sense of business or outside of personal usage, right? Like I, I joined Facebook fairly early on and I was using it just to like communicate with friends and people in college, right? And Twitter was probably the first platform aside from my blog and maybe YouTube that I joined to start like going outside of my personal network, right? And I was very fortunate in a lot of ways. I got listed on a article about like the top eco-friendly accounts to follow on Twitter purely because I was one of very few accounts uh, posting about that sort of thing, right? So again, like I was a big fish in a small pond and then that started to shift. So a huge percentage of my eco-vegan gal, which was the brand that I was known for for many years and still, I guess people know me for that, but that account following started very, very early. And it hasn't grown as much as in the last few years. So this is what I mean is I've, tr I've been doing a lot of the same things, but it's not getting the same results as it used to. Same thing with Facebook. My Facebook page for Eco Vegan Gal grew exponentially, completely organically by pure luck. Like it was one day my account started to grow really high. I don't know how. I think there was some algorithm going on, Facebook promotion back in probably like 2013, 2014. So I, those, those things sometimes just happen from luck. And I've noticed this in a lot of ways. I've noticed this with my podcasts. A lot of the work that I've seen is being consistent for a long period of time and kind of being in the right place at the right time. I noticed this with Clubhouse, like every platform I get on. And and I guess if I had to give one piece of advice, it would be if you can get on a platform early, which we saw in 2021 with Clubhouse, for example, and TikTok is another great example, is that if you can get on these platforms on the earlier side and figure them out, the algorithms tend to really work in your favor. And then people start to look to you since you've already been on there. There's a big benefit to being an early adopter if you have that within you. But I've also noticed through having a lot of clients that most people are not. And in fact, there's a, a whole like curve that shows the percentages of people that make up their decisions when it comes to something new. And being an early adopter is, is rare. It's a, more towards the bottom of the curve. A lot of people, similar to what we were talking about before, they yeah. look to others they look to influential people to help them decide if they're going to try something. So that's why by the time you decide to start a clubhouse or a TikTok or whatever else is new, uh, most of the time you've lost that opportunity to grow your following really quickly. So that's kind of been my secret sauce. I mean, I did that with, with clubhouse earlier this year mm. and I've barely used clubhouse for months, but I still have that following from the beginning of the year <laughs> and people see it and they're like, wow, you know, that's yeah. pretty great, Whitney. And I'm like, but it's only great if I'm actively using it. And I think that's, that's, you know. Right. Do you, yeah. Do you think that, yeah, Clubhouse is kind of going, going away now, maybe? <laughs> I, I know I hear from a lot of people, like even myself as well, hardly on there anymore. Yeah. It's, 
I'm fascinated by it. I'm actually working on a clubhouse related project with one of my clients and I'm really interested to see how it's going to go. I don't know at this point and we're recording in August 2021. So anything could change. We'll wait and see, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's similar to what Snapchat created, which when Snapchat came out, again, when was that? Like maybe 2013 or 14, I felt like it was becoming really big. Nobody took it seriously. And it was like some app that people would use to like post things that they wanted to disappear. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, why would you ever use that? Why would you want your photos and videos to disappear unless you're trying to hide (laughs) something? For some very dodgy reasons. Exactly. (laughs) And that's what Snapchat was associated with in the beginning. But then it started to become something that people enjoyed using. And and we saw platforms like Instagram. And now every platform has these stories, including TikTok. They just announced that they're going to be doing stories. Who knew? Now, people still, of course, use Snapchat. Yeah. The younger generations like Gen Z are really into it, but it faded off for millennials and people that were using it in the beginning. It shifted, and now all these yeah. other platforms become more dominant. So my guess is that will happen as the ripple effect from Clubhouse. It'll stick around, but other platforms, as we're seeing, it's already the case, are going to start using live audio in different ways. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Twitter's already started, right? And and Facebook is rolling some stuff out too. I'm sure it's only a matter of time before we see that even more of that. I, I wonder if something like Clubhouse will get swallowed into an, another bigger ap- application or company because of that. But, yeah, but like I say, it'd be interesting. To, it will be interesting to see what happens with that for sure. One thing I, I am curious about, now you, you say about all the reasons that a lot of influencers are just doing stuff to, to be famous because they just want the following, they want the vanity metrics. Why do you do what you do? I and mean, what's the change, the, the impact that you are most looking to make through what you do? It's a great question that I have to ask myself often. <laughs> well, I would say... If I go back to the core of where I started, I I was just, it was an outlet when I began. Like it was certainly a personal reason of enjoying that form of expression, enjoying the, the connection that I was making. And I really enjoy recommending things. <laughs> I'm somebody that loves reading and writing Yelp reviews. I, I love reading reviews anywhere. So now I do my best to post them. And when somebody says that a review I wrote helps them make a decision. I feel like I've done my job. (laughs) I love (laughs) guiding people and helping people reduce whatever form of suffering is at the core of my work too. Being a vegan, that was a huge personal motivation. It's like, well, the vegan lifestyle reduces suffering for animals, the planet, and and our health in some ways. So that made sense for me and I wanted to spread the word about it. And now with my focus more on the well-being, especially mental well-being, I, I want to help people feel better about themselves and what they're doing in life. And so if I can do that through my social media and relieve somebody of whatever stress they have, I feel like I've accomplished something. Yeah, I was trying to mute because some some people are going by. Now we're just about to get a big announcement coming out, so... Uh, <laughs> you can probably you can probably hear it we're in a little spanish village i'm in a little spanish village and several times a day they do these pa announcements of uh, of what's happening in the village probably tomorrow or, or something like that so <laughs> it's very cute in a sense it's not ideal what? when you're doing a recording but <laughs> <laughs> but in a way that actually kind of ties into this right because it's like those experiences feel more and more rare like we we kind of start to lose our sense of community in a lot of ways through digital content but when you're in a place like you are now where the community is brought together in in this quaint way it's like i hope that we can do more of that online you know, I, I want that. I want more of the one-to-one connection or one-to-few versus one-to-many. I think that's so much more rewarding. Yeah. I think I think what I've noticed about myself may translate to others, which is like, I don't want to feel lost in the sea of people. I want to feel like I matter to a small group of people. So I would so much rather 
have a deep impact on a small group, just like that, uh, <laughs> that announcer does in the village that you're in right now, then feel like, oh, it doesn't matter. So I'm going to broadcast this on television. Whoever sees it, sees it. It's like people just wash over what you're doing mm-hmm. versus like really take in what you're doing and, and having a big impact on their lives. I think that's so much more rewarding. Uh, yeah, I get that. I, I, I like what you're saying about that you like reviewing things as well. And I was thinking, oh yeah, I, I almost forgot that I was like in the top percentile of reviewers on TripAdvisor because it's been so long since I've been anywhere <laughs> to, uh, to be reviewing stuff. So oh yeah, I was reviewing stuff all the time. And it just, since uh, since COVID and everything, it just stopped. And it's like, oh, I, I, want, to, I want to start doing that again because I, I enjoy doing it. I enjoy seeing this review has helped so many people and and such and such liked your review and things like that. And, and I do it all the time. I still do it all the time on Amazon and Audible. And, you know, I will leave reviews for books. It tends to be, you know, if I think a book's kind of bland, I just don't bother. But if I think it's really good, I leave a review. And if I think it's terrible, I leave a review. Stuff that kind of falls in the middle, I don't really bother with so much. But uh, yeah, I, I think it's a really good thing to do. But I love what you're saying about the, the connection stuff as well and how much more important that perhaps we do just focus too much on the wrong things we're so focused on having big followings and getting our messages out to everybody and having all these metrics that if the right people are connecting with you and and loving what you do then a a small group of the right people has a lot more value than a huge group of people who don't care that much for sure i really love that yes and and going back to The future that you were discussing about, I think actually that is a big shift we're starting to see right now because over the past few years, brands have been encouraged to work with micro influencers, as they call them, which is typically someone that has maybe around 10,000 followers, more or less. I forget the what the exact range is. Maybe it's like 10,000 to 50,000. And and I fall into that category in a lot of the platforms that I'm on. And it's interesting. They call that micro versus like a lot of people will never get to 10,000. <laughs> sounds followers. like a lot to me. But, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, It is a lot. Yeah. It is. I don't know what the, ter- there's so many terms now, but my point being that the micro influencer has become more important to brands in a lot of ways because they realize that micro influencers can often have much more influence over a higher percentage of people than a macro influencer, right? So somebody that has a million followers, they may not have as much influence as it seems because it's too large and there's too many people and like, who knows how they got their numbers. Sure. But engagement started to matter so much more in the marketing world because brands realize that if somebody has a highly engaged audience with long-term trust built up, they have a much higher chance of influencing them to make a decision. And now that brands have caught on to that, it's exciting because it, there's no longer this huge pressure to be, get all these followers, but more to have a deeper connection with the community there. And I'm excited for that. And I, I imagine that that's going to become a bigger and bigger thing in this industry. In fact, I, I believe I've read predictions on that at a certain point, since so many people are getting on social media, almost anybody will be considered an influencer, even if they have a very small audience, because if that audience is deeply connected and moved by the messaging, they will take action. And thus, that's very valuable to a brand. That, that gives me hope, Whitney. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad. I, I, I hope that that's true as well, because I like the sound of that a lot more. People people who are actually engaged, because, you know, you may have that person who, as you say, bought their following or maybe had that one video or Facebook or Twitter comment that went viral and it's got them a whole load of following, but they don't have an engaged audience. Whereas people who are putting out perhaps valuable content, hopefully, are getting engaged audiences. And those are, those are going to be the great people for them to connect with and have audiences that are like oh well this is this is someone who we actually care about what what products they use or what products they recommend so long as we use that that status responsibly as well i guess we don't want to recommend any other thing yes one thing i do want to talk about before we before we sort of move to the, to our end of our chat is it's about podcasting because you are a podcaster uh, and I want, in terms of having impact and influence in the world, 
what got you into podcasting as a medium to reach out to people uh, and share messages and conversations and whatever else you, you choose to do that? You know, if I had known it was going to be such a big part of my life, I, I would have paid more attention to the beginning stages. But the truth is, like many podcasts, mine started on a whim with my friend Jason. And I honestly wish I could pinpoint like that conversation of like, hey, let's start a podcast. I think we just wanted to experiment with it, but really had no idea what was going to happen. And now we are nearing 300 episodes of that show and we started our second show and it's just been incredible. And it's something I can see myself doing for a long time. I think the, a huge moment for us as podcasters was when we met Tracy Hazard from Podetize, which is a company I now consult with. And Tracy really encouraged us and gave us guidance and structure in a way that we could see the long-term vision. So I remember that vividly. We, up until we met her, had recorded maybe like 10 episodes or so. She encouraged us, and we hadn't released any of them. We were just like recording them. Trying, We didn't know like what we were doing. And I was like, Ugh, I have to go figure out like where do we host this and yeah. setting up the website. I was dreading it. So we were just recording. And at, at that point, when I could see how we were going to do it and also have support from Podetize, which just made it all so much easier, everything started to come together. And we decided to record like 20 to 30 episodes before we launched. We launched This Might Get Uncomfortable in December 2019. We were encouraged to do three episodes a week, and we've sustained that, although for the first time we're dropping down to two episodes a week as an experiment. Mm. And um, the momentum has just been easy to sustain for us. Jason and I have worked, as I said earlier, in the this content creation world for each over 10 years. We're used to speaking. We're used to connecting with our audience. We're used to recommending products and sharing things that are on our mind. So it flowed really naturally. And I think it also just feels very rewarding. There's something about just sharing and kind of like be feeling really open and free on a long form platform like podcasting. Unlike trying to make these like short 60 second videos, which to me actually feels a lot harder. Yeah, get and <laughs> the depth in which you can connect with people as a podcaster is so rewarding. So it goes back yeah. to what I was saying before. It's the numbers just like you are don't matter as much to me as the experience of podcasting and the deeper relationship I built with people who listen to my shows. The, the one of the other things, that, and, and this is something that I I really got from from Tracy actually because I, I listen to her show The Binge Factor quite often. It, it's a it's a great show. If you if you're a podcaster and you don't listen to The Binge Factor, check it out because it, it's very helpful. But it was along those sorts of lines of understanding that once people get a sense of your show, they may discover it a bit later on but they will go back and check out your, your past episodes. People, there are people who just want to binge stuff, like people, like same as people binge Netflix and whatever else, people binge podcasts. And so they'll, they'll maybe find your show. The content's up there for, for as long as you, you know, unless you remove it, it's up there for as long as you are um, hosting it. And so there's lots of inactive podcasts that you can still go and listen to but you know, more and more active shows are coming up now. But if people find the show, like an interview that you may have done in your earliest days where you may have had, I don't know, three downloads for an episode or maybe a bit more, hopefully, that you might suddenly start getting lots more downloads for it as people find the show into the future. So you're not just uh, creating one-time content that's never going to be found again people will actually go and explore podcasts and and it's it's interesting i mean i, I think I, I agree with a lot of the sort of leaders in the podcasting world right, that it's still very much in its um in its infancy as is a medium but like yourself I, I love it as a way is i find it a cozy way to explore stuff and the way like it's not just short form stuff i like to go deep on things and yeah sure you want to have some abbreviated stuff everyone wants to save time but sometimes 
you just want to listen to an interesting conversation and learn some stuff from somebody who has different life experiences and different professional expertise to share that could be valuable to you and, and to what you do. What, what are your feelings or thoughts on the future of podcasting? Because you said it's something you want to carry on doing potentially forever. I, I agree with that. But what do you think the future holds? It's a, that's so interesting because I'm not quite sure, to be honest. I see a lot of people starting podcasts. I feel like there's been another wave of it. <laughs> and it's been around for so long, but it, it's so interesting to think like we still have such a long way to go where I don't really have that feeling about a lot of other platforms. It seems like social media platforms have their phases for like a few years, maybe 10 years, and then that something else comes along and people are more interested in that. We've seen a shift from images to video, but audio has kind of had this and blog, just similar to blogging, I think. Both of them have like this more sustainable, like slower pace growth. And I think video, as it becomes more important, a lot more people will be doing video. I think live streaming, like I said, thanks to platforms like Clubhouse, is evolving. And it's interesting that video live streaming has been around for five or six years very mm -hmm. strongly, but audio really burst into the scene, you know, in, in late 2020. I mean, yeah, 2020 and uh, early 2021. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's a bigger focus on video and live podcasting, but I feel like there's something else. Like there's, there's gotta be a direction in, in it, that it goes that we can't even fathom at this moment, which I think is really exciting and staying committed to it is important. Yeah. Yeah, there'll be some visionary will come along and, and completely revolutionize the world of podcasting or something like that. I, I saw, I found out just uh, just last week that uh, I don't use Podbean, but I found out that Podbean is, uh, as far as I know, the only platform I've seen so far, at least, that is enabling live stream audio. So you can live stream your audio podcast. And that's that to me is very interesting. I'm not sure I want to do it. I think I'd rather live stream video. To me, that makes more sense. But but yeah, I, I thought that's actually very interesting. And you can even set it up to, to like a, a radio style call in kind of thing. If you have that kind of show, that could be very interesting for a lot of people, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, but I think the future of podcasting is wide open. I, I still think it's a very exciting medium. I agree with Seth Godin saying that it's the it's the new blogging it's the is the new place for thought leadership and and that's what it's expanding into and, and I, i'm running with that i'm running <laughs> running with that uh, whitney i, I wonder as we, uh, <laughs> as we as we as sort we of start to draw things to a close uh, i wonder what's the best place or best way for people to find out more about you well i've set up my website whitneylauritson.com to be a bit of a hub in the simple way where there are links to contact me and listen to the podcasts and see some of the other work that I'm focused on right now. So I would say going to that, but because of the magic of SEO, if you type my name, even if you misspell it, I believe you'll find me pretty easily on many social media platforms, websites. I mean, I'm all over the place for better or for worse. And it, it's once you find me in one place, you'll be able to find me in others. In other <laughs> so I've created so much content over the years. I have SEO on my side. So WhitneyLauritson.com if you want to get really specific. But if you just type Whitney Lauritson in Google, you'll find me. Perfect. Now, I, I always like to ask my guests for a book recommendation. In your case, I might ask for a podcast recommendation as well. What, what would be a book or podcast or resource, uh, or maybe more than one, if you like, that you might recommend to people, maybe based on some of the things we talked about, or maybe just some stuff that's had an impact on you? I love this question. And it's really tough for me to narrow it down. First of all, I don't listen to that many podcasts right now, believe it or not. Since I do work with Podetize, I'm very tied into shows like, you know, I think anything Tracy Hazard does, she has a number of podcasts, is really worth a listen. She's got a brand, one or two new shows coming out at, at the end of 2021. So that's exciting. But other than that, I mean, I just know a lot of podcasters, but I, I don't listen to them because I'm listening to audiobooks most of the time. I, I love reading. So when I'm in the car, I will read by listening. And I'm, I will cycle through books so quickly that it's hard for me to really recommend. But I would say my top recommendation for the past year has been uh, Do Nothing by Celeste 
Headley. She was a guest on my show, which was like the greatest honor because when I read Do Nothing last year, I I just felt like it was so fantastic. And her book is really a, at the core of our addiction to efficiency and productivity. And those are things I'm really passionate about because they can often drive us into burnout, mm -hmm. the comparison trap, struggles with our self-esteem, depression, a lot of mental health challenges. And at, she goes deep into the history of productivity and hustle culture and the benefits of slowing down and doing less and resting and getting to our inherent worth and the reason that we're here on this planet. So it ties into everything I'm passionate about right now. Excellent. And she's done some amazing work. And a second author I've been really into recently is Sherry Turkle. She wrote a few phenomenal books about technology and human communication, including Alone Together. And the other book is, I think, called Reclaiming Conversation. Gosh, I'm blanking on the name of that one, but <laughs> Sherry Turkle, if you look her up, she's lovely. And I feel like Celeste and Sherry go head to head on the depth in which they're observing where we're at as human beings. And the research that they've done in the commentary is incredibly valuable if you're interested in how do we have deeper relationships and stronger communication. Yeah, those sound like my kind of books. I, I haven't heard of them. I love getting recommendations for books I haven't heard of. And as you're an audiobook person, I'm hoping they're on audiobook as well. Because I, I listen to a lot of audiobooks myself. I absolutely love audiobooks, much like yourself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so they, they will go on to my they will go on to my reading list, Whitney. Thank you. Amazing. And and if you don't already use this, John or the listener, um, Libby, L-I-B-B-Y, is my favorite resource. It's from a company called Overdrive. And it allows you, at least in the States, I'm not positive about international, but I believe it works. There are other similar services, at least, where you can connect your library card to this virtual library and get digital books and audiobooks for free. Wow. And it is just phenomenal. It saves a ton of money if you're used to using, you know, Amazon and Audible and all that stuff. And you can go and find virtually any book. So I have a queue of books constantly thanks to that that I read either on my iPad or listen to it. And yes, both most of the books by Sherry and Celeste are available on there as well to listen to. Fantastic. Well, that's a great resource recommendation. I'm going to check out if that's available uh, here in Europe where I am. And if it's not, then you know, you're lucky people in the US, you can get to access that. I, I think that's a fantastic recommendation. <laughs> as, as we wrap things up, if there's one thing you hope that people will take away from this conversation today, having listened to it, what do you hope people will most remember? I hope that the listener remembers that they are beyond measure, that powerful beyond measure, which is part of a famous quote on this from Marion Williamson, actually. And that's, you are so much more than your numbers and your accomplishments and any of these external measures of success, which we often focus on. But if you tap into the deeper sense of purpose and happiness that you have at the root of who you are and what makes you who you are, I think that is increasingly important to pay attention to because that gets us through a lot of tough times and helps us make better decisions. So whether you're a podcaster or business owner or a person just going about the world and whatever that you're doing, if you can be rooted in your personal purpose and sense of self, I think it will guide you through life in a really strong way. That's fantastic. Winnie, thank you so much for everything you've shared today. It's been it's been a really wonderful conversation. I, I knew it would be, and it went uh, it went to some places that I, even I didn't even I didn't expect. But it's been fascinating and interesting, and and you've shared so much with us. Clearly, uh, of someone who likes to go deep and likes to have those relationships, and that's my kind of conversation. I really appreciate you uh, coming and sharing that with us today. Thank you so much. I appreciate it too. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed the show. I really enjoyed that conversation. And 
it gave me some hope. It gave me some hope that it's not all about having those big numbers, those vanity metrics that Whitney talked about, that really we should be aiming for connection. We should be aiming for providing value. There's so many people out there who are getting the clicks and the following through being intentionally controversial or really just posting shallow stuff. I'm like, okay, I'm saying there's not a place for that, but I would much rather be someone who is part of putting out content that is valuable for people, that is improving people's lives, making, making things better in some way, shape or form. And I hope that you would too. Now, if that's something you can get behind, then you are definitely in the right place and uh, we can definitely be a part of the same community together as well. And I hope we will be. If you found some things in the show yourself that you could take away and, and make use for, or you just found some stuff really hopeful or interesting that we discussed, then please consider sharing the show out with your friends and network because it really is only by sharing these great conversations that we get to grow the show, but we also get to impact more people's lives and make positive changes there. And we really want to be helping people to be able to understand and utilize influence and persuasion in ways that are putting good things out into the world. That's our tribe and I invite you to be a part of it. If you'd like to support the show financially, you can certainly do that and you can visit our Supercast page. It's in the show notes. You'll find it on the Buzzsprout webpage as well for the show. And you can do that for as little as five US dollars a month. If you would like to take a membership level and be invited to exclusive recordings, joining me and my guests when we record the show, being able to submit your questions, perhaps even directly to my guests, then you can join the membership level of Speaking Influence, also available in the Supercast page. If you would like to be a sponsor for the show, if you also recognize that it's not all just about those big numbers, but it's about the connection and the value then we would love to hear from you and you can help us to make speaking influence an even bigger and better show so wherever you are whatever you're doing i hope you have an amazing rest of your day please do come and join us for upcoming guests some of the guests i have coming up are people who have been making impact and creating influence on a national stage influencing and affecting government policy and industry direction too now if you're interested in that high level of influence and persuasion and how these people made those things happen then you are definitely going to want to make sure that you are subscribed to the show and that you don't miss those episodes that are coming up so wherever you are and whatever you're doing have an amazing rest of your day go and make great things happen